Hi there, and welcome to Military Histories, a podcast from York Army Museum. Each week we share an interview from the Royal Dragoon Guards audio archive. Throughout May and June we will be sharing interviews with World War II veterans. You can find more details about the Royal Dragoon Guards oral history project in the show notes. If you want to find out a bit more about our museum, there are links to our website and social media channels in the show notes too. In this week's interview you can hear Mr. Eric Johnston talk about his army life from joining the Royal Armoured Corps, training for the Normandy landings through to the German surrender. Mr. Johnston served with the 4th 7th Royal Dragoon Guards from 1942 to 1947. Thanks for listening, future episodes will drop every Friday. This recording is taking place on the 18th of September, 2013. Eric will speak about his time with the 4th 7th Royal Dragoon Guards during the period of 1942 to 1947. Eric, would you like to share with us your earliest memories of joining the army? And yes. Then the regiment. I was a, a bank apprentice, having left school where I only had half day schooling because of the war. I slipped out of the bank at lunchtime one day and went to the uh, recruiting office where I was the only other person present was the Cardinal L.J. Cripps, who I found out later was believed to be a relative of Sir Stafford Cripps, future Chancellor of the Exchequer. Anyway, I I volunteered for the army uh, implicitly for the Royal Armoured Corps and short time after that I got my call-up papers to go to Bovington. I'd already served in the Home Guard. My manager of my branch was a major in Home Guard, had won the military medal in the First World War and uh, I enjoyed that very much. We did night guards at the gas works and the electricity works, fire rifles, and it was, it was a good experience. Anyway, I went to Bovington, never been south of Edinburgh in my life before, found it very exciting going down to England and was in the 58th Training Regiment where uh, several distinguished 4 7 Royal Dragoon Guard people served including General Sir Robert Ford, who was a contemporary of mine, and and Jim Brackenridge, who was a trooper, then a sergeant, with me in the army, and became a regimental sergeant major of the regiment Mm -hmm. post-war. After six months training, we were sent to field regiment. We were given a choice of several regiments and one of my pals came from Keithley, told me about the 4 7 Royal Goon Guards and about 15 of us went there. We were off the train, regimental sergeant major divided us up into different squadrons. Uh, a, th- a, th- a fateful moment of time would, would show, and uh, then we continued our training. I may say we got a very good thorough training, lasted six months in Bovington, and I thoroughly enjoyed it. Uh, what I liked about the army, I was never outstanding, but I was never the worst, so I survived all right. Enjoyed army life very much, and went to the regiment uh, in Keithley. The, we were trained, and... Uh, went to Heveningham, and then Fort George. But while we were in Keithley, we were told to go to a meeting at the local cinema where Major General uh, Hobart was to speak to us. He told us that as a regiment, we were going to be in the forefront of the invasion of Europe, and we would have amphibious tanks. This turned out to be the DD tank in which we were trained and first time we went to sea with these tanks was at Fort George. We sailed from Fort George 
in January, very cold, very wild night, landed at Burghead Bray, uh, north of Scotland, in the morning at dawn. Sea was too rough, so we didn't actually use the amphibious part, but waded ashore. And then we moved up and did further trading further north. But that was quite an experience. And then we moved uh, down to the south of England, where we did similar trading at Studland Bay, and lost six tanks in one of the exercises. And several men were lost, and the sole survivor in one tank was General Sir Robert Ford, who was then our intelligence officer, Lieutenant Robert Ford. Anyway, we went then, stayed in the south of England, eventually went to closed camps and went to Normandy. But by this time, I found I wasn't to be in the first wave going ashore. I was put in the Reiki troop. And we had, instead of General Stuart, uh, we had General Stuart tanks and not Sherman tanks. And the General Stuart was a light reconnaissance tank. And we waded ashore after the DD tanks landed. The regiment had several casualties on DD. <coughs> we had casualties to our own troops, unfortunately, on landing, called so-called friendly fire. But then we joined up with the regiment on Hill 103, one of the focal points in Normandy, and uh, did various reconnaissance, heard the sound of gunfire for the first time, and in my own experience was that we were sent in a recce to Tilly Sur, Sur Sul, uh, not very far inland, were knocked out, I think, by a bazooka and uh, bailed out. I sent a signal to the Sea Squadron leader, Major Bell, went to look for our second tank with us, found it surrounded by German soldiers, so that was the end of that experience. And then we were sent to BU, got a new tank next day, and then carried on with the very bitter fighting that went on in Normandy. The German tank reinforcements were arriving, and uh, D-Day was relatively easy to the days that followed. <coughs> we then uh, were taken out of the line for a while, and then we were back in the line when the regiment had a famous occasion at the village of Langevre, where five tanks, five German Panther tanks, were knocked out with five shots fine, sign, fired by my Scottish friend Ian McDougall, with Sergeant Harris as his commander. Uh, that was... Well, and that, uh, that particular occasion, the, uh, there's an oil painting in the officer's mess. By, by a painter called Shepherd, yes. That's, that, that's, that's, right. that's right. Now, the interesting thing is, there's photographs in the Imperial War Museum of, of the two of the Panther tanks lying at the side of the road, mm. the road beyond Langevre. Yeah. They were actually bulldozed at the side of the road because the action took place on the 14th of June but the photographs weren't taken till the 20th of June. <laughs> but Shepard and his painting got them in the right position oh, yeah. on the road. Artistic now, license. only one of our tanks was uh, knocked out that day. Uh, also a photograph in the Imperial War Museum. Uh, and Corporal Johnson was killed. But the Durham Light Infantry casualties were very severe. I think about 200 lost, missing and wounded. 
and this was a pattern throughout Normandy that the majority of the casualties were in the infantry. And we certainly had a heavy casualties too, but nothing like the infantry. Mm -hmm. uh, straight, fairly straightforward actions then. We took part in Operation Epsom, where many tanks were lost. We didn't take part in Operation... Uh, what was the name again? Also named after a well-known race course. It'll come New back market. to me later. New uh, Market? Pub. New Market? New, uh, no, it wasn't New Market. Uh, it doesn't ma really matter. <laughs> but it, it was a very... The fighting was very hard at that time. And the uh, casualties were very high. And then later on... We were told, we were going to be spoken to that by 30 Corps commander, a General Horrocks. Now, General Horrocks had been taken over from the previous Corps commander who had been dismissed. Mm -hmm. And he told us, he, we gathered around him, I remember in the open air, and he told us in a few days we would be sailing through France. Now that is very hard to believe because I'd been in a Bocage country which is very difficult country to move in. But uh, he was a great personality, raised our morale and he was quite right and a few days later we were taking part in what was called the Great Swan. Uh, we went down to, through Rugles to the River Seine at Vernon we were the first British Harbour troops to cross the river on rafts. We then moved on, took the town of Gisors. I was very much involved in that. I happened to be in the lead uh, tank, reconnaissance tank. Uh, Major Ian Gill spoke to us before we left off and said we ought to make a cavalry charge as he put it with a smile on geezers and we had to find out the strength of the enemy in geezers and uh, we set off down the hill outside geezers broke through a hedge at the foot and there was a startled boy on a bicycle and I shouted at him in French Ouelig Bosch <laughs> he replied, Combien? And no, he, he, first of all, he pointed to the town. And I said, Combien? How many? And he said, Boku. Fortunately, he was wrong. We moved cautiously into Gizors. There was very heavy explosions at the other end of the town as the retreating Germans blew up their munitions. And we moved through and eventually arrived in Bovey, by which time the big boys, C Squadron, had moved ahead of us and they knocked out a King Tiger in Bovey. Mm -hmm. We covered between 50 and 60 miles that day and were taking enormous quantities of prisoners who were giving themselves up. Unfortunately, the Maquis were uh, active there, so we very gladly handed over the prisoners to them. It wasn't straightforward, but we had to slow down. We didn't go as far any other day as that. But uh, it was a completely different reward to what we've been experiencing. Anyway, we then crossed the uh, River Somme. We expected to be going to Brussels, but instead we went to Lille, where the population had no idea we were even approaching. I remember crowds came into the streets, flowers, bottles of wine, tanks were completely surrounded with people, 
All the squadron leaders got very anxious, but they did manage to move us out of the town for the night. Uh, we then moved on gradually to Belgium, Borg Leopold. I remember we were in army barracks in Be Borg Leopold, which was quite a treat, showers. <coughs> And then we were told we were going to, about the attack on Arnhem, we were going to join up with the Guards Armoured Division. And uh, we set off. It was an extraordinary experience because uh, the front for the whole corps was only about 30 yards broad. That's about the length, the breadth of an autobahn. And, the roads in Holland were raised roads, so we were very much uh, easy targets. And in crossing the start of the thing, there was eight tanks knocked out by a single, there weren't four seventh tanks, but eight tanks were knocked out by a single 88 millimeter anti-tank gun. And uh, eventually typhoons were brought in and they knocked the tank out. Anyway, we moved on with various skirmishes, doing various reconnaissance duties. And then we were told three of our tanks, including our, my own, were seconded to the 82nd American Airborne Division. And that was a great experience because just as soon as we, we realised they were landing all round us in gliders, crashing the planes like watching a slow motion film. A lot of the Americans were wounded in the crashes. We helped them out. I remember one American soldier handed me that morning's daily meal with a smile as he passed. And... Uh, we stayed with them for a couple of days doing reconnaissance and then we moved back to our own regiment who were then in Nijmegen. We crossed the river Rhine by the railway bridge over the river. The road bridge hadn't been taken at that time. We were in various actions in Elst on, on the area of ground we called the island. Got up as far as Driel doing rec reconnaissance work. And then, sadly, the paratroopers had to come back and they passed through us. We spent a few more days in Nijmegen and then we moved to another part of Holland, a long way away, Brunsum, near the German border. And Brunsum was a mining town. Once again, welcome pit head showers. Uh, we did various reconnaissance work there. It was getting late in the year then. This was the autumn. And uh, we moved into Germany. And then we were involved in two actions. First in the Reichswald Forest where we took part in what turned out to be the biggest artillery uh, barrage of the war. With every tank gun, apart from the artillery, firing, given references where to fire to with elevated guns, targets we couldn't see, of course. And then we moved on Gardenkirchen and took part in another exercise called, now I forget the name, it'll come back to me in a moment, but by this time the Americans were in action at the Ardennes. It was Christmas, New Year, eh, enormous forces attacking the, the Germans, and we were not involved in the fighting there, but we were on the fringe. But we, our, we were given the job to clear an area around the River Roar. Yes, it was called Operation Blackcock, I remember now. And we moved reconnaissance troops, had to move at night under searchlights called Moonleys 
Monty's Moonlight, uh, we were sent in a recce. Uh, we had to find out if a bridge had been blown or not in a particular river. It, despite the artificial moonlight, I was asked to go forward with a stick to prod the ground to see if the bridge was intact or not. I soon heard rushing water and found the bridge had been blown. I was then, I sent a message back, I was a radio operator, I sent a message back and uh, was told to find out if they could cover, cross the broken bridge and planks. So I went back, but it was far too broad, the, the cavity to cross by planks. So I reported that. We were sent on another recce, different road. We were fired on. Fortunately, our steward tanks could move quickly, got under cover very quickly, and then moved on. And then we hit a teller mine, probably two teller mines, one on top of the other. Uh, I was co-driver, wireless operator, crew of four. And I sat side by side with the driver. Uh, poor Bill Elms had both his legs blown off was clearly dying, but I managed to give him morphia to ease his dying. Sent a message back to the troop commander. He sent another tank up to us to rescue us. It came up alongside. We climbed up on the survivors, the three of us, climbed on to the tank engine. They moved off. <coughs> blew up again. Uh, Co-driver, wireless operator, Mick, was injured on this occasion. Fortunately, not fatally. Uh, so that was the end of that. We signalled for medics who eventually came up and we made it back to the uh, regiment. Uh, <coughs> I remember after that uh, we spent the night in a, what I think was a monastery. I remember I spent it on top of potatoes in a cellar. We were living very much in cellars at this time because the winter bitterly cold, snow on the ground. And uh, I spent the coldest night of my life. But uh, moved on, got a new tank <coughs> after about a couple of days. And this was a revelation because it was the latest mark of the General Stewart tank with automatic gearbox and with rubber uh, patches on the steel tracks and was a treat for our new driver to drive. <coughs> we then moved on various skirmishes, wreckies to the Rhine uh, I remember Churchill came over to watch the crossing of the Rhine, where they used a lot of paratroops, but the, the resistance was very weak then. We, the Rhine is a vast river. We crossed the river in rafts, moved on. Uh, there was some fighting, and our, our, some of our echelon troops were taken prisoner there because they had unfortunately got mixed up with a gang of of uh, German paratroopers. Uh, we then moved on onto the wonderful German Autobahn roads. And uh, uh, one place I remember we came to and uh, took after a fairly brief fight and reconnaissance was Bremen, where we liberated Beck's brewery. And uh, <laughs> made the most of it. I still always order a Bex beer when the occasion arises. Mm -hmm. I say to my companions as a matter of conscience. <laughs> I moved on. Most of the danger now was not from German tanks, but German handheld bazookas. Uh, 
but we found a technique to do that with spraying the ground ahead of us and we finally finished up near Bremerhaven. Now one day I remember particularly uh, I was sent, our tank was sent on a reconnaissance like most reconnaissances we were given three points to go to three code words to pass back if we got there safely. We reached point one and two safely and then before we reached point three we got a message that hostilities had ended, the Germans had surrendered, uh, we hadn't to go uh, any further forward and uh, hostilities would cease at 8 a.m. the next day. So we went back, rejoined the regiment, and next day we moved through sullen German troops who were still armed, uh, but not hostile, and went into Bremerhaven, or a village near Bremerhaven, I remember Ochtrup it was called, and uh, that was the end of the war. Church service next day, which was a very moving, Moving experience.